Hello booktube, my name is Erica and as you can probably tell from my nerves, the lighting and the lack of editing that this is my first ever upload. I originally intended to make my first upload a book review, um, however um, my attention has recently been piqued by a comment uh, by Justin on Triumphal Reads, I think in his history, one of his history challenge videos about the general lack of re readily available resources regarding archaeology and, and prehistory for the general public. And this is really true if you walk into a Waterstones in the UK or Barnes and Noble back in the States, then um, you know the, the history and nonfiction sections will be filled with ancient history, modern history, local history, but the archaeology section, if they do have one, is slim at best. And you know, it's probably full of fringe archaeology ideas, you know, things that you might want to look out for and, and not necessarily, it, it, it just discredits the field. So um, it, I understand it can be a frustrating and overwhelming experience. So the purpose of this video, I suppose, is in part to give you a very, very brief um, history lesson for context about um, specifically Neanderthals, but um, over um, overarching ideas in Paleolithic archaeology, um, and um, also in part a few book suggestions if you are interested. So hopefully this inspires someone or, you know, you might find it helpful if anyone is watching um, about what to look for and, and point you in the right direction. So before I continue, um, I'll start by just saying I do have an MA and an MSc in archaeology and, and Paleolithic archaeology. So um, specifically looking at, you know, um, the evolution of hominins, um, not just humans, but specifically my area of research is um, Neanderthal hunting practices and also what we can gather about their intelligence, livelihood, and, um, you know, what the archaeological evidence says about their capacity to maintain belief systems. So... Um, yes, I, I start by saying I don't actually own a lot of general knowledge books purely because a lot of the resources that I do use are scientific articles on, online. Um, however, I'll share with what I do have with you and, and point you in the direction of some authors online. Um, so just to give you a bit of context, um, I'm just going to give you a very brief crash course about Neanderthal evolution. Um, so evidence suggests that Neanderthals and um, Homo sapiens had a common ancestor around 800,000 years ago in Africa, and the population that dispersed out of Africa and into Eurasia eventually evolved in the, to Neanderthals. So Neanderthals are a uniquely Eurasian hominin, whereas the population of that common ancestor that remained in Africa eventually evolved into modern humans. Homo sapiens. Um, so in the 1860s, there was a fossil, um, the type fossil that was found in Heidelberg, Germany. And this was studied extensively. And the researcher who did study it essentially said that um, this, this person was a hunchback, brutish, and, you know, um, this led to the idea that Neanderthals were incredibly unintelligent brutish apes. Um, whereas what we do now know is that the Heidelberg specimen was actually elderly and arthritic. So unfortunately, this has shaped and uh, this has shaped the understanding well into the 20th century that Neanderthals um, were, were brutish, unintelligent, and inferior to humans. Um, if we just backtrack a bit um, to human dispersals, um, modern humans um, began to disperse into Europe around 40,000 years ago. And around 30,000 years ago, if not a bit later, um, by some uh, you know, scientists account, um, Neanderthals went extinct. And there's a lot of research that focuses on the, you know, the positive correlation between human dispersal into Europe and the extinction of Neanderthals. Um, around 
you know, the time frame when the, you know, the, um, this coinciding extinction was um, being proposed. Um, in the 80s or 90s, there was this um, idea that was also proposed called the cognitive revolution, where all of this material artifactual evidence that we have for humans in the form of beads, artwork, you know, Lesko, you know, paintings like Lesko um, in, in Europe much later. Um, these represent, um, you know, the behavioral, uh, cognitive and, you know, intellectual um, modernity in humans, but the, but that, you know, Neanderthals have somehow missed the boat on this. Um, and this is because in the 80s and the 90s, there wasn't the evidence that we have um, today, which suggests similar cognitive capacity. So things like, um, you know, shell and um, bone that were manipulated into um, meaningful, possibly symbolic objects. You know, the fact that Neanderthals were painting in caves well before the arrival of humans in, in Europe, um, we didn't have this evidence back in the 80s and 90s, and unfortunately, this coinciding with extinction um, when humans arrived led to the idea that humans were in every way superior to Neanderthals in terms of intelligence, complexity, art, everything. However, as I've just mentioned, this is this is frankly not true. Um, as we know this from the huge wealth of evidence that has been discovered as recently as the past decade or the past two decades in the form of um, shells and uh, talons, which um, have possibly been, you know, manipulated and, and worn as, as jewelry um, from sites that are found in um, uh, Croatia. Um, uh, just loads of evidence and um, I won't get into it too much because you'll be able to to read more in in the books that I'm going to suggest um, the first one of which is my books are going sliding um, the smart Neanderthal by Clive Finlayson um, so Finlayson is among other things um, a paleoanthropologist um, from Gibraltar and a lot of the excavations that he's done in caves in Gibraltar, um, you know, have uh, helped propel or uh, pro propel the notion that um, Neanderthals are actually more complex, um, able-bodied um, uh, uh, sister species than we previously um, believed. And He's also an avid bird specialist, so a lot of his research and his graduate students' research focuses on um, bird bones found in caves and the non-alimentary, um, that meaning the non-nutritious aspects of, of bird um, hunting by Neanderthals, bird hunting, um, you know, the acquisition of bird bones by Neanderthals. And the reason why this is interesting is because it suggests that Neanderthals were harvesting feathers um, they were manipulating bird bone in, and talons for decorative purposes. And the reason why this in turn is interesting is because it um, demonstrates that they weren't the brutish apes that we pre previously thought or understood them to be because they were creating meaningful objects, which, um, you know, were mutually understood and, and validated um, their beliefs. So um, another one by Clive Finlayson, which I don't have in my collection, but, sh but would, would be a good one, is The Humans Who Went Extinct. And this is um, by Clive as well. However, it focuses on um, why Neanderthals went extinct and, and humans didn't. Um, a third one, um, which I also don't have, um, is called The Neanderthal Man by Svante Pabo. And this is more of a memoir about Pabo um, sequencing the Neanderthal genome. But uh, the reason why I'm mentioning it as well is because Svante Pabo has a lot of good TED Talks on YouTube about, um, you know, the Neanderthal genome and interbreeding with humans. So um, 
all humans um, apart from Africans have uh, up to or around 2% Neanderthal DNA. Um, and, you know, some populations have more um, like Papua New Guineans. Um, so around 2010, when they, they did publish the Neanderthal genome, it was understood that Africans didn't have any Neanderthal DNA. And this was believed because, you know, um, the humans who migrated out of Africa intermingled with Neanderthals in Eurasia. And then, you know, um, that's why uh, Europeans and Asians have their DNA. However, we do know as recently as last year, I believe that, you know, some African populations do have Neanderthal DNA, and that's believed because, you know, populations that moved back from Europe back into Africa um, brought that bit of their DNA with them, um, not because Neanderthals had moved out of Africa and, and were intermingling with Africans there. But in any case, um, if you're more interested in, in the DNA side of Neanderthals, then this is a useful um, and an interesting book. Um, the final one, um, which I have ordered and is on its way, is Kindred by Rebecca Ragsyke. I had the pleasure of listening to her speak at a conference recently, um, but uh, essentially this book, again, is a really good general overview of um, Neanderthal sociality, complexity, looking at, you know, the evidence for um, death and burial beliefs in the afterlife and, and just good for, you know, debunking the myths, uh, the myths, sorry, the previously held ideas that we had about Neanderthals and, and why we need to put those to bed. So that's on Neanderthals. Um, if you're not interested in Neanderthals, but more so the human side of, you know, human evolution, migration and um, dispersal across the world, then this one by Steve Myven is a good choice. Um, it's less on the evolution side and more it focuses on what happens after the last glacial, glacial maximum, so the last ice age, um, and then, you know, what sort of changes that occur, um, you know, when the environment changes and our dispersal into the Americas um, and looking at, uh, you know, the emergence of agriculture quite a thick volume. There's a lot to cover. It doesn't just focus on one area. It focuses on, um, you know, as I mentioned, moving into the Americas. It looks at, um, you know, Chattahoyuk, um, Cyprus, um, Japan, the Arctic. You know, there's loads in here that, you know, might pique your interest. Death and Burial. If you're interested in the archaeology of death and burial, anything by Michael um, Parker Pearson is a good option. He's um, pretty much the go-to guy in the field on, um, you know, this body of research. And then a lot of the other books that I have um, are mainly anthropological resources. Um, in the States, archaeology is a subfield of anthropology, whereas, you know, in Europe, it's more of a humanities. Um, and that's mostly to do with the fact that a lot of American archaeology, prehistoric American archaeology, looking at um, Native Americans or First Nations in, in Canada, um, we don't have written resources for them, and we need to we we need to utilize ethnographic resources of modern um, populations in order to inform our understandings. And that's a whole nother video about the appropriate use of ethnographic resources, um, in order to interpret the past, but really that's all we've got. So, um, some of the books that I have in my collection are pretty dry, but you know, if you are interested, it's worth picking up. So I've got this on the Plains Cree. Um, I've got, uh, that's by David Mendelbaum. Um, if you're interested in the Plains Cree, um, I've got this called Soul Hunters by Rain Willerslev, and this is a really interesting look at um, the Siberian Yukigir, um, their hunting practices, but also, um, you know, their belief systems and how what they know, or how they know what they know, called ontology, informs um, their day their daily lives. And then I've also got this on the Rock Cree called Grateful Prey. 
um, by Robert Brightman. Um, and this is uh, specifically a look at human animal relationships. And I found this quite useful because uh, a lot of my research on Neanderthals um, looks uh, specifically focuses on, um, you know, their hunting practices, but also how they would view their prey, not just as prey objects, but you know, how they as a society would have um, viewed them. Um, so this is another good book. And then on archaeological theory, um, if you were to go into any search engine right now and type in archaeological theory, probably the first thing that'll pop up is Michael Johnson. Um, and I think the last edition was published around the turn of the millennia. Um, so a lot has happened recently about in terms of borrowing or, you know, um, applying new um, theories from other fields into archaeological research. Um, but if you are interested, Johnson's archaeological theory is a really good basis and he's good at explaining it in layman's terms, um, you know, the history of archaeological theory and just the um, different theories that have really formed the backbone of archaeology since um, the 60s when it became a scientific field. So um, that's um, pretty much all I've got for you at the minute. Hopefully you found that useful. Hopefully, you, you know, you might pick up one of those resources and maybe you even have questions that you want to ask. I don't necessarily know the direction that I'm going to take this if I'm going to do more in-depth archaeological um, videos, but I guess that's really if anyone does actually watch this and says that they are interested in it. So um, we'll see what happens, but hopefully you did find that helpful. So thank you and until next time.